So hello everybody and uh, I think it's uh, just gone half past two so we'll get started. Welcome to this event, Land, Investment and Migration, a Portrait of Village Life in Mali. I'm Juliet, IID's Events Officer. Uh, this event today forms part of the IID debate series which, through which we aim to create a space for conversation and debate on key and current sustainable development issues. So we've got an excellent panel of speakers today who are going to be introduced shortly. And I can also see a lot of you already on the call and the number keeps going up. So welcome and thank you for joining us from all over the world. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Andrew Norton, IID's director, who's going to introduce our panel and chair this session. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Julia. And huge thanks for all the great work you've put in to setting this event up. Uh, much appreciated. So the title of the session, as Juliet said, is Land Investment and Migration, a Portrait of Village Life in Mali. Um, and it's a real pleasure for me to introduce our um, first speaker, our, our keynote speaker, Camilla Toulmin, um, who's an economist with e great experience and expertise on dryland Africa. And she was actually my predecessor as director of IIED. And I first met Camilla, in fact, in 1982, um, when I just started doing fieldwork in Mali, and she was still in Dilongibugu, this extraordinary community, um, which the book that um, this is based on, which I really do recommend all of you to try to get hold of. It's an extraordinary study based on 35 years that Camilla has um, done research in the village going to and fro but some very deep dives indeed within that and it's an ex a, a portrait of extraordinary depth of social change in the Sahel in Mali so really looking forward to this. Um, let me also quickly introduce the two discussants who are going to comment on the presentation. Uh, Professor Nicholas Stern is the chair of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment and head of the India Observatory at the London School of Economics. And I'm sure known to very, very many of you for um, an extraordinary track record of influential policy work. Um, many of you will have heard, I'm sure, of the Stern Review into the Economics of Climate Change, which was a seminal work in the field that we work in. So really delighted to have Nick with us as well. And the other commentator, also a complete delight to have Barra Gay joining us from Senegal. Um, Barra is a rural economist with more than 35 years experience of development practice in Francophone West Africa and also a member of IIED's board, one of our trustees. So a huge pleasure to have Barra with us as well. So without further ado, um, Camilla is going to um, give a presentation which will give you um, a taster of the richness and depth of the work that she's presented in her book. And then we'll move to commentary from uh, Nick and from Barra, and then a Q&A session using the tools that Julia just outlined. So Camilla, please do start. Great, well, good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'm just going to set up the um, slideshow so that we can have some pictures and you can get a bit of a sense of um, the place that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us and thank you also to Andy Norton, my fellow panellists, Barragay and Nick Stern. I really appreciate the time you've given to read my book and provide your comments today. I've been very lucky in following the village of Dolongabugu in central Mali. That's the little blue star, which I hope you can see um, on the map. So I've been following it for the last 40 years. Bugu means hamlet or village. So Dolongibugu means the hamlet of Dolongi, who was the founder of the settlement. I first went there as a 25 year old researcher in 1980, at the height of the hot season. And I was last there in July 2017. While it's currently off limits due to the presence of various jihadist groups in the, in the vicinity, I stay in regular touch via my wonderful research assistant, Siddiqui Jara, who's based in Bamako. Both Siddiqui and one of the villagers, Makano Dembele, 
have been great to work with because they're committed both to field work and to gossip. And gossip is a really core skill for this kind of mix of economics and anthropology. I'm hoping to get back there one day soon. There's so much more to learn about and I'd like to see how to help this village, commune and wider region address the multiple problems they face. So I'm gonna give a 15, 20 minute introduction to the village so you've got an idea of where it is, what it looks like and who lives there as well as some of the principal trends over the last three to four decades. Please do send in your questions. On point une nouvelle question également en français, car nous avons des participants du Mali. Mali cow, in it lay. Sumogo kekene. So, I'll outline five elements that shape how people make a living and how these have changed over 35 years. Um, and you see the main topics there. You could say that to study one small settlement is only going to be of limited interest. But I hope to show that what's been happening in this one village represents a microcosm of the powerful forces operating more generally across the region. Jalongibugu now is a small town of 1,600 people, which has become a lot more prosperous since I first went there in 1980. But if you were to drive past it, you'd be deceived by the traditional brown mud houses. There's not a tin roof in sight. But if you look carefully, you'll catch sight of some of the solar panels they've bought and the odd satellite TV dish. And if you go into one of the houses, you'll find that actually it's a shop where you can buy more than a hundred things like cloth, flip-flops, underpants, motorbike parts, medicine, sugar, tea, and mobile phones. When I first went there in 1980, you could only buy eight things, salt, sugar, tea, cola nut, sweets, batteries, kerosene and cigarettes. So there's been an explosion in shopping. In 1980, I went to do two years field research working with an anthropologist, Duncan Fulton, to document village life and patterns of farming, livestock investment and demography. We were working for Jeremy Swift and the International Livestock Research Institute. I wrote my PhD um, and also a book, Cattle, Women and Wells, on the village. And I've kept going back to Delongabugu every two or three years to find out how my friends are doing. I continue to work with Siddiqui Jara, who's uh, top left, my research assistant from 1980. And he and I supported Karen Brock, bottom center, an IDS researcher who was there in the mid-90s. The village chief is up top right and his deputy, and the president of the Women's Association is top centre. So when I stopped running IID in 2015 and handed over to the much more capable hands of Andy Norton, I sought a research grant to explore in more depth what's been happening in Delongibugu. And I'd like to thank the Open Society Foundations New York and the Binks Family Trust Edinburgh for the funding that made it possible. I've tried to develop a set of infographics to illustrate these changes in ways which bring statistics to life, beautifully designed by Kate Lines and Anna Mill. So Delongibugu, the village, is inhabited by Bambara farmers, settled on the northern edge of the farming zone, 50 kilometers north of the river Niger at Segu. The Bambara are a farming group that has spread across much of Mali. The village was founded probably around 1700. It was certainly there when Scottish explorer Bongo Park 
traveled through the region in 1796, looking for the River Niger, and he stayed the night there. By this stage, he was at the end of his tether. He'd lost everything except for a broken down horse, which was so weak, he was obliged to drive it before him. So he must have looked a sorry sight. Following the French conquest of Segu in 1890, this area on the north bank of the great river Niger was seen by the colonial administration as very impoverished, not worth much attention. Instead, they invested money and lives in building a large irrigation scheme, which you can see to the east of the village, constructed in the 1930s. And this is now the focus of a lot of attention from government donors and foreign investors, because irrigated farming is seen as the best way to grow food for the Sahel in an era of growing climate uncertainty. And that contrasts with the rain-fed millet farmers of Delongibugu and beyond who are described as traditional, stuck in their ways, reliant on the hoe, unable to modernize. But I hope my study shows that that assessment of Delongibugu misses much of what's been happening in this and similar Sahel villages. So settlement and farming thin out as you move northwards from the River Niger. Delongibugu gets an average of about 450 millimeters of rainfall per year, but this is highly variable. Rainfall has actually increased a bit over the last 35 years in terms of total volume, but is more concentrated in the four months of June, July, August, September. There are also larger, more extreme events. Farmers say distribu distribution of rainfall within the farming season is much more important than the total amount of rain. What farmers like best is medium-sized rainfall every four to five days with plenty of hot sun in between. Then the millet flourishes. Last year, the village received an astonishing 160 millimetres of rain in 24 hours. That's six inches, a third of the expected rainfall for the year. There was standing water everywhere for days. Many houses and granaries fell down, latrines collapsed and much of the millet was drowned. Some villages in the commune have abandoned their settlements completely as the damage from the flood was so devastating. Climate science confirms this big increase in intensive convective weather systems, which lead to the large storms responsible for 90% of the Sahel's rainfall. And this seems to be due to the fact that the Sahara Desert is warming much faster than the Sahel. Turning to land, in 1980, the villagers of Delongabuku said, the bush is so big, it can never finish. Going north from the village, there seemed to be a never ending supply of land to farm and for cattle to graze. But when I was back there visiting in 2006, they said sadly, the bush is finished, it's destroyed. So I was interested in asking, how has land abundance turned to scarcity in 25 years? Why has the bush filled up with people? On the left, you've got um, the image from the 1960s and on the right, you've got the image from 2016. So one of the things that happened is that in the 1970s, farmers living next to the irrigated zone to the east of Delongabugu started seeking new land because irrigated crops like sugarcane harbour large numbers of birds which ravaged dryland cereal fields before harvest time. By 1997, when Karen Brock was doing her study, there were hundreds of people from close to the irrigation scheme who'd come to the Delongabugu area to farm and to escape these, the bird pests from the sugar. But by the year 2000, the villagers of Delongabugu had sent them all away. They got fed up with all these migrants 
and they blamed them for crime, harassment of their women, and general moral turpitude. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But after a few years, many came back, begging their cousins in Delongabugu and neighboring settlements to let them farm a plot of land in the name of their common humanity. Then in 2009, 20,000 hectares was given by the Malian government to a Chinese company, Ensukala, for irrigated sugarcane. The company has evicted hundreds of farmers from their land, and they're now all flooding into the Delongabugu area, begging to be given a plot to cultivate. As you can see from these satellite images, um, the sugarcane fields just occupy all of the land. The village settlement is still there, but people have lost all their land. The consequence is, as this 2016 image for land around Delongabugu will show you, is that all of the space around the village has now filled up with fields. Population growth within the village itself is important, but the largest share of land around Delongabugu is now in the hands of stranger farmers, most of whom have come in the last 10 years following the arrival of the sugar company. This diagram shows you what's happened to the total area under cultivation. The big increase in the area cultivated, which is the size of the blocks, um, and the relative importance of different forms of land use has also changed a lot. There's been a big rise in strangers' fields, that's in blue, and of private fields, they're the ones in yellow. Private fields refer to the growing number of plots of crops such as sesame grown by individuals for their own cash revenue rather than the millet farms fields farmed by the household as a collective group which are the ones in green and purple. As land becomes scarcer there are damaging consequences for the farming system. There's a shortage of grazing, a fall in livestock numbers and a fall therefore in cattle dung which leads to a fall in soil fertility and millet yields. So yields of millet have really tumbled catastrophically since 1980 to 82, and much formerly manured land has been abandoned. So this slide shows what's happened to the size of the millet harvest um, and the proportions coming from extensive bush fields in purple versus manured land in green. Overall, the weight of millet harvested per person has fallen from an average of 500 kilos to 180 kilos per person, which is a huge fall with major consequences for food security and the size of household grain reserves. Herder farmer relations have also become very tense with conflicts escalating into lethal clashes in this neighboring area. So the farming system is under real stress. Let me turn to talk about the second important element of village life over the years. Demographic growth has been remarkable over the 35 years. There's been a tripling of the village population with an annual growth of 3%. This high level of growth is the result of a patrilineal family system involving early that means that women at a very age are very rarely outside of marital relations. And this family pattern, combined with better water supply, improved health care, and the absence of any modern form of contraception, all spur population growth. In 1980, I thought that the large domestic groups found in Delongibugu would see a breakdown in future as smaller nuclear households became the norm. But that's what's happened elsewhere in rural Africa. But rather than falling apart, I've found that there's been a big increase in average household size from 18 in 1980 to 35 people today. And there are now five households with more than 100 people in size, the greatest of this with 184 people. These are enormous domestic enterprises. 
able to marshal large amounts of capital and labor for farming, but they also need careful management in balancing the rights and obligations of households to their members. Having run IID for 12 years, an organization of 100 or so people, I can testify to the difficulty of balancing individual against collective interests. And in the case of IID, they weren't even my family or relations. The household or gua is defined by having one common field, one common granary, and a single household head who represents that household in the village council. Within the household, some activities are carried out at the level of individuals. If your household head, you want lots of young men like these to farm the millet field, but you also have to find ways of keeping them loyal to your family. These large domestic groups have been of a special importance as a means to reduce the multiple risks facing people in this low rainfall environment. Risks which you mitigate by diversifying your incomes, assets, and activities. Despite the advantages of large household size, there are also a number of cases where households have broken up, as shown in these slides. The smallest households are unlikely to do well in farming, and I expect that if they go back in another 10 or 15 years, many of the smallest households won't be there anymore. Turning to assets and investments, everybody in the village admits that they've got better off, they've increased income and wealth, and the business of farming has got easier, thanks to ploughs and donkey carts. I did a quick tally of assets and their value today in Dlongabugu, and they come to around half a million pounds, 328 million francs CFA. That's a big sum of money, and it gives a lie to smallholders being unable to invest in their farms. This shows the pattern of asset distribution between different households according to the different assets. Women in particular acknowledge that they're better off than before. So Hawa Kulibali, president of the Women's Association says, now we've got richer, we've discovered all sorts of wants and needs we didn't know we had before. As a village, Delongabugu is known for its competitive rivalry, which pushes individuals and families to outdo each other in getting the biggest harvest or having a large cattle herd. This rivalry between people and families has contributed to a sequence of investment booms. First were oxen-drawn ploughs in the 1950s and 60s, which led to a big growth in groundnut production. Then in the 70s and 80s, there was a rush to dig wells, which led to a big expansion in water manure contracts agreed with visiting herders, which brought lots of dung and better millet yields. Then in the 1990s, lots of people set up shops. They were the next important money-making venture. And today there are 13. After that, sesame fields became widespread in the 2000s and have been a big cash earner, while solar panels are today's newest assets. Shopkeepers often buy big panels costing 150, 150,000 francs, that's about 250 euros, so they can run a fridge and offer cold drinks to their customers. Since 2000, a total of more than 5 million francs has been invested by villagers in solar panels. That's 7,000 pounds. None of that is project money. It's all money that individuals and households have invested. So each investment cycle follows a similar pattern to that which you see with solar panels. One person brings back a new idea, two or three others copy it, others watch and wait, and when it's shown to be a big thing, a good thing, everybody else piles in as soon as they can. Migration is also much more common today than 35 years ago and takes multiple forms. Almost all unmarried men and women go away each year for nine months over the dry season to earn money once the weeding is over. Young men go to the capital Bamako, sometimes to the gold fields in Western Mali or to Côte d'Ivoire. 
young women workers maids in Bamako. This pattern is similar to what was going on in 1980, but people leave much earlier and come back much later. They're often away for nine months or sometimes several years instead of three to four months. But the biggest difference, the biggest difference between 1980 and today is the number of people who have left Dalungabuga definitively, like Ganaba Dembele here. There are more than 25 men with their wives and children who are making their lives away from the village, building a house in town, investing money in their children going to school and learning a profession. A couple of men have reached Europe. One's in Cote d'Ivoire, another in Angola, and five have just disappeared. No one knows if they're living or dead. People from Dolongabugu who live in Bamako say it's tough. You need cash for everything. Food, water, shelter, school. But they can't see themselves going back to life in the village, even if life in Bamako is tough. They say their children are Bamakwa, and they wouldn't be able to stomach the food and water if they went back home. Finally, a couple of words about attitudes and values. The people of Dolongabugu say that life has changed immeasurably since 1980. There's been an explosion of consumerism and much greater individualism. Most people want to acquire more stuff and people compete to get the biggest motorbike or fanciest hair and clothes. It's in marked contrast to the simple threadbare days of 1980. Older folks say this focus on consumption has come at the cost of social cohesion. The village chief says no one wants to be together anymore and points to the old shade trees where people used to gather and chat. They're now empty and abandoned. He's very worried that so much time spent on private production means less effort is spent on the household's big collective millet field, which ultimately is responsible for feeding everyone. The collective granary shrinks while individual pockets expand. And the figures for millet production per head support this concern. There are other big shifts in values and behavior, such as the abandonment of traditional religion, They've, they've converted to Islam and built a mosque. With decentralization and setting up of local government, Dolongabugu has acquired a primary school and a health clinic, which is all good. But the new commune boundaries have fragmented Dolongabugu's customary lands, so they've lost control over their resources. So I hope this has given you an idea about the history of the village the purpose of my study and how some things have changed over 35 years. Many of these changes have been very positive, but some set the village big challenges for the future, challenges which are common to many other places in the Sahel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla. That was great, really fascinating. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in already, please just to remind you to use the Q&A box if you want to raise a question for Camilla or for Nick or for Barra. Um, now let's move to the discussants and Nick, you've kindly agreed to go first. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Camilla. That was absolutely fascinating. And I think, I think somebody on this call uh, has to uh, show the book. So it might as well be me. This is, uh, this is the book that Camilla was telling you about. And uh, there's another one from Andrew. Um, it's a special pleasure to, um, to join this group. Uh, there, there are people who study villages over long periods of time, but they're not very many of them. Um, I've been working on one village in Uttar Pradesh in India since 1974, and we've got data that goes back uh, thank you very much. There's Nick's book. <laughs> Data that goes back to the 1950s. So um, you find that people, there are not many of them, but some who've done these long longitudinal village studies, exchange ideas, talk to each other. So I've been talking to Camilla about this for many years, and I, know, I knew the book was coming, and it's absolutely a tremendous pleasure to see the book uh, now. The 
what the book shows and very clearly, and you saw it clearly in Camilla's uh, introduction here, is how much you can learn about how lives change from the close study of one place. If you look at the statistics of countries, you see lots of what are essentially time series of cross sections. There's lots of surveys that go on that tell you what, uh, how many people are at school now and so on. And you see graphs which show change, um, but they don't tell you how individual lives change, how the lives of people change in the same way that a close study of one place can do. If economic development, and I'm an economist, so excuse me for focusing there, but if economic development is how lives and livelihoods change, then a key part of the understanding of that question, how lives change, is through a village study. And this is just a wonderful uh, example. Of course, longitudinal stuff, by definition, takes time. That's the point. That's what it is. So you have to start young and you have to live long. Those are essential uh, uh, requirements if you're going to engage in this. Um, but I, I do know that uh, Camilla hasn't lived for quite as long as uh, I have. But there'll be more, 35 years, I'm sure 10, 15 years from now, we'll uh, see the half century of uh, this story and we look forward uh, very much, uh, very much to it. Now, what kinds of things can you learn? Well, the first thing is that you can learn how to study development. Essentially, I've just uh, referred to that. But talking to people, observing uh, directly, collecting uh, the numbers in, in one place, that's a very important way to study development. I stress that because so much of development studies now is about uh, randomized control trials, for example, which are very important and valuable, but they do not tell you uh, the story of how lives change over time in the, uh, in the same kind of way. So as we get enthusiastic about one tool for studying development, we shouldn't forget the uh, basic here, which is such a fundamental part of our uh, understanding. It tells you, secondly, it tells you directly how lives change. You follow people in terms of their assets in terms of their lives and their and uh, their their deaths. You follow the uh, education, and we saw it just now from Camilla how instructive uh, that story uh, can be. Thirdly, you understand the place. Now, I I've worked quite a bit in Africa. I mean, much more in India and other places, but I don't know Mali. And the book uh, told when telling its story in this way uh, brings Mali to life for those of us who have not yet had the uh, privilege of, um, of being there. So I found that very valuable. And at the end, uh, in chapter eight, it turns to the big question of where the world is going through the eyes of um, uh, Blonge Bubu. And that, I think, and let me finish what I want to say around that, because I think that is a fascinating part of the story. Um, I know it's not fashionable and for understandable reasons to quote Winston Churchill at this time, uh, but I'll take the risk, uh, bearing in mind all the footnotes and uh, that we have to uh, uh, attach. But um, he said that you know, the farther back you look, the further forward you can see. And I think that is an important uh, observation. And um, Reading chapter eight, I felt very much that uh, looking back in that way, you could see so much further forward. And we have to remember that looking back over these 35 years, in a sense, it's not any old 35 years. I mean, there's a long history there. You could have imagined a snapshot from the 19th uh, uh, century or the early 20th. But this is an extraordinary 35 years with a tripling of uh, population, the arrival of all kinds of different ways of doing things connectivity with the outside uh, world, which is always a question around uh, villages. It's an extraordinary 35 years. So it's telling us a lot about change. And so we can look forward and ask about the future. And I think back, I've been, I started teaching economic development around 1970. And we tried for students who hadn't been all over the place uh, to give them a picture of the difference between different parts of the world. 
and we used to talk, I mean, it was very uh, broad brush, but we used to talk of uh, India, South Asia being land scarce and Africa being land abundant. Now, it wouldn't be right to talk about Africa being land abundant uh, anymore. We didn't talk much about climate uh, in the 1970s. We have to talk about uh, climate now. And we spoke much less about conflict at that time uh, too when we were studying development. So because the world has changed, our subjects and our thoughts have had to change and our ways of doing analysis have had to change. So let me finish just with one or two questions which you might expect from an old village studies uh, person thinking about those kinds of change. In Palampur, the village that we've been studying in India, there's been a big move to the nuclear family. Um, previously, villagers used to live in quite big households, um, not quite as big uh, as in uh, Dlonge Bugu, but still quite big households. There's been a big move to the nuclear household, and it'd be very interesting to hear, perhaps we'd have time towards the end, speculation as to how far uh, that will happen. There's been a big move to off-farm income. More than half of the uh, village income in Palampur is off-farm. And there's a very big difference there between India and Africa, at least the parts that we're talking about, in that the population density in India in the Indo-Gatchaka plain is so strong that there's always a nearby town. So there, you can live in the village and do work in the nearby town. You commute, you don't have to migrate. And you've seen lots of activity making uh, bricks, marble, polishing and so on. Uh, renting out tractors to work elsewhere. You've seen lots of income off farm now. And that seems to me to be very interesting because in the discussion of uh, Blonge Bugu, a lot of the off farm income was associated with Bamako. And uh, it'd be very interesting to see how that changes over time. In other words, if you want to leave agriculture, you leave, as opposed to uh, doing diversification within the place that you stay. Maybe that's a difference between the indo gangetic plain and uh, this part of Mali. But the rise of off-farm income is very important. And it's informal. It's normal here. Off-farm income isn't about going to get a job in a factory somewhere. I mean, occasionally it's that happens, but it's much more about informal activities with brick, the making bricks or marble polishing or fixing people's motorbikes or you know, all the kinds of things. Uh, that, uh, that you see there. So I'd be very interested to hear more about the uh, about uh, non-farm income. And finally, there's a fascinating discussion in chapter eight about re-greening. And as a world, we have devastated the soil. We've mined the soil, we've depleted the soil. That's true, I'm speaking to you from rural Sussex in Southern England. That's true when I look out my window and I go for a walk, it's true there too. So whether you look at India, whether you look at Mali, whether you look at uh, Europe, we've been mining soil and uh, un or undermining, destroying, degrading soil. So regreening, I think, could be a really big part of the future. And of course, regreening benefits the people who do the regreening because productivity uh, goes up, but it also benefits the world. And uh, you capture carbon in soil. So in a in a world better organised than our own we would be finding ways of rewarding people for regreening. That's not impossible. Perhaps it's not even that difficult, but you have to make up your mind uh, to do it. But that I felt was a fascinating part of the story at the end. So thank you so much, Camilla. It was an absolute treat to uh, talk about it for many years with you, uh, to read the book and to hear you just now. This is something that uh, I hope students of development uh, across the world will read. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Um, some fantastic insights there. Camilla, can I ask you to take the questions from Nick with the questions from Barra, and just and that way we can try and also move to some from the audience as well. So, Barra, please, you go next. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, I would like to join my voice to yours and uh, to Nick's to congratulate uh, Camilla for a very, very interesting book which I would recommend for uh, 
not only researchers, but also I think uh, development workers and students, uh, there are a lot to learn about uh, rural life, but also about longitudinal uh, research. Having said that, I will uh, focus my comments on um, all this question of change. I think the book, the book is about change and uh, how change happens in rural life and what are the drivers of change. I'm using just uh, three markers for my comments uh, to reflect on the change that, is, that has happened in this village. I think one of the, the first key word or marker is the concept of stability. Um, we know that in our traditional society, uh, the household or the family is at the heart of the life of the system. And uh, all the strategies that are developed within the family or around how you keep um, stability for the unit since the whole life through the whole system depend on family labor. So it's very critical that you have a control on, on, on these uh, uh, sort of resources and the way it is managed within the family and at the large uh, sense within the, within the community. And um, I think if, if you look from the 80s to now, we see all the changes that's happening with this concept of, of, uh, of um, stability, where in the more, more traditional area where, um, period, the focus was only on agriculture and under the, all the labor was within the, uh, the family and it was easier to manage uh, compared to now where you have a lot of, um, as uh, Nick was saying, off-farm activities happening outside the village. And this is a critical challenge on how you allow people to go out of the society and the community at the same time keeping this, this spirit and the stability. And I think it's a very critical sort of how old management challenge that all the rural uh, communities are facing um, now because of the change that happened. And I think you will see it in the, in the village, um, the older challenge that the fact that young people are traveling is bringing in the management of uh, the, the household, I mean the labor within the household. So that's the first thing. Other thing I think is the, the, the notion of reciprocity. Reciprocity is key in our traditional society. And most of the relationship with you have, first within the family, you have re reciprocity um, between members of the same family, combining uh, farming, private uh, farm and collective farm, which is a certain way of really exchanging and, 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 and managing reciprocity. Within the larger group, which is the, the, the village, you also have this, the different families within the village maintaining a certain level of cohesion based on the way they manage the reciprocity. Um, you have family um, originating from different, different, uh, different villages, but at the same time, they try to have a sort of homogeneous mix which is based mainly on that through marriage, through also uh, the whole issue of how they uh, sort of uh, manage power uh, at the village level. And uh, this, um, I think, is also based on some form of reciprocity among between the different families. And the third level of reciprocity is between the, the, the household members and our people coming from outside. And good example, or for example, the relationship between the household and the herders who come seasonally uh, to, to, I mean, with the animal. And this kind of um, reciprocity based the fact that you allow the herders to access to water, at the same time they bring animal and they are fertilizing your land. So you are having you know, a way of making your soil more fertile without having to have 
uh, cash expenditure. And this has changed over time because these relations have become loose now and we, they have moved from a type of reciprocity where which is based on, on kind type of uh, exchange to a new relationship where money is intermediating, uh, intermediating this kind of relation. And this is also a very big change which changed the whole landscape of how this concept of reciprocity is managed within the village. And the third marker is the whole around the also, also of, of assets uh, and how the asset portfolio has evolved over time. In the past where you have mainly uh, asset around land, labor uh, and water. Um, and now with um, the, a more open society with more interaction with the outside world, you have new form of assets. Uh, Camilla was talking about the solar panel, access to uh, electricity and other good also change the, uh, the, the asset portfolio and at the same time, it change also uh, the, the whole uh, organization of the local economy and the economic system. And I think this change sometimes bring opportunities and advantage, but at the same time, they are associated with with, uh, with um, a lot of challenge. Um, and the fact, the fact that uh, cash and money is play, uh, playing a stronger role in the transaction is really having a quite key impact on, on the relationship between uh, individual within the family, but at the, at the village level at, uh, at large, and even between the village and the outside of them. And I think these are very important change that we have seen happening uh, over time. And uh, we can anticipate that maybe the, it will, uh, I mean, develop even more um, in the future. And um, there are a lot of uh, question mark uh, regarding the future. The second point uh, is around the role of policy and the relationship between, uh, or the role of central government. If you read the book, the first impression you have is that uh, the government is, is, is not really, um, you can't see sign of the presence uh, of, of the government, uh, except of a few um, very uh, minor things. But uh, the only presence you see is sort of a sort of dis disruptive presence, which means that, uh, for example, the investment uh, in, um, in the office de Niger and the implication it in terms of really uh, disturbing the whole, this issue of, of, I mean, the stability I was talking about by bringing in new migrants and putting more pressure on the key resource, which is the land. And that's policies, it, not enabling, but policy which are disruptive of local economy and local stability. And I think this is a very, uh, very uh, sort of, uh, um, critical thing which uh, we can see and which uh, tend to, uh, to develop over time. The other impact of policy also is the fact that the traditional boundaries of the village has been sort of uh, um, disrupted in the sense that the administrative uh, boundaries imposed by the, by the government doesn't match with the traditional boundary. And in the future, this might end up with, with some conflicts and the fact that people you know, belong to a village, but their land may be uh, in, on another administrative unit. What are the implications um, um, on, uh, on, 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 on the future? And all these change, I think um, you have said very well, said it very well, I think, Camilla. We have increased conflicts uh, happening um, because of, of these uh, external exchanges. Um, the monetization of the relationship, the relation between, I mean, farmers and others, and even within the within the society. And I like one saying, what an old person say. He was saying that in old days, it was the household who was rich and the individual were poor. But nowadays, 
individuals are rich and the household is poor. And I think it's a quite strong sent, uh, sort of sentence showing the big change that is happening and the tend tendency to go to a more individualistic type of way of life, and which um, I think over, over time can be very disruptive of these three markers I was saying, which was stability, uh, the, 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 the whole system of reciprocity, and also the idea around um, asset building. So I think this is very, very, very interesting. And uh, maybe one last point on this comment is um, the impact of climate change. And I think uh, we, we have seen it. You said it, I mean, the rainfall pattern has, has changed, even though in terms of a quantity of water, it doesn't have be, be changed, but the, 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 the way this uh, the rain season is spread over time has completely changed and, and is bringing a new uh, threat in uh, uh, on the economy. But what is interesting is how people um, people attitude regarding climate change. I read a pay, um, somewhere, I mean, was saying that people try to adapt, but they don't explain actually what are the main causes of climate change. Uh, you, you, you are giving this example where they were seeing, uh, they have this sort of supernatural um, explanation of, of climate change, which means that um, the implication will be that I think um, the strategy will be more fo will focus more on adaptation than on attenuation in the sense that uh, if they don't explain maybe they want the strategy are only meant to adapt to the to the phenomenon but not really to really uh, act as game changer in a sense that they understand the cause and they try also to really act on on on, on those goals so there are a lot of questions now for the future and I think one uh, particular question is really um, in 10 years or 15 years time, what will be the perspective of the youth? Because that's very critical. Uh, migration is, is, is uh, one important asset. So far, it's national and you have few, a few cases of regional uh, migration. Most of the time, it's seasonal. They, they come back to the village. But, you know, what the future look like in terms of how uh, the, the migration pattern will be is, is, is a quite uh, important um, question. The second question of the future is policy narratives. Um, in a context of insecurity, um, I think uh, the government of Mali has putting a lot of resource, you know, uh, in, in addressing the addressing the question of insecurity, um, and um, we are in an era where all our government are really thinking about, um, you know, future agricultural policy and other econ development economy uh, policy in, 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 in at large, but we don't know what will be. Uh, the patterns of, of this policy uh, narrative in the future. And uh, the la last question is about ro the role of education. Um, it's, we don't see um, so far, I mean, it's there, but uh, what will be the of education over time. Um, until now, I think it's quite uh, small, but um, will we be seeing uh, more investment in education, people going more to, to school or, or abandoning if, if young people turn to travel, if they may remain school and, 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 and others. So these are, I think, some of the, of, of the questions which um, maybe uh, will require a future reflection um, and um, of course, uh, one question to challenge uh, Kamila will be the will be with the next uh, book, um, <laughs> the next fifteen years or twenty years. You are writing another <laughs> another book. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barra. Um, again, a great set of comments. Very very rich. Um,
Camilla, let me just um, add a couple of thoughts that have come in on the Q&A, if I may, which are in the same areas that have been highlighted. I know I'm giving you a lot to deal with at once, Camilla, but I'm sure, I'm sure you will be fine. Um, on the question of climate change, we, which was mentioned by Barra, we have a question in from Laurie Goering. Um, on the whole, things seem better, but this is complex. Do you expect that to continue? Or will problems including climate change shift that trajectory? Um, on the methodological questions which Nick raised, a question from Dan Brockington, who's recently um, undertaken some longitudinal studies in Tanzania. And he's asking, you know, how did you capture this in the different periods you were in the village? And how well do you think the changes you have described are captured in standard or existing uh, development indicators. Um, and finally on conflict, which um, Barra mentioned, um, a question from Musa Jiri. I would like to know if there is a link between the situation you've described and increasing local conflicts or the conflict in the center of Mali and how did that impinge on Vilonga Bugu? And there are one or two other questions I'd love to get to because it's a very rich set. But Camilla, there's a huge amount there. Please pick from it as you will. Right. Well, thank you very much. That um, gives me lots to respond to. I'll try and be reasonably quick. And then if there are a couple more questions, we can take them before the end. Uh, Nick, you talked about the move to the nuclear family and, and what's been happening in Palanpur. And certainly that shift to a nuclear family is what you find really through, throughout many other parts of Africa, particularly West Africa. So I was really gobsmacked to find that um, you'd seen something very different in this particular community. And I don't think it's the only place where the maintenance and investment in that domestic, large domestic group continues. Um, uh, because there are such, you know, strong, advantages from being able to pool labor to be able to pool your demographic successes and failures um, to be able to cope with the risks you face but obviously it does also require that individuals subsume their own personal interests um, and agree to be managed by a household head that household head retains respect and loyalty for so long as he's able to meet the expectations of the people within that group, which, I mean, essentially are giving people a certain amount of room for their own individual activity while requiring them to also invest in the collective enterprise. Um, and young men will stay in Bamako unless they have heard that arrangements are being made for their marriage. So it's really, old men's capacity to provide wives for their, um, their young men that, that brings them back home and settles them back in the village, working and investing in the domestic group. It's interesting what you said about um, how dense the Gangetic Plain is. At the moment, as you say, rightly, um, people have to go away if they want to diversify their incomes. Bit by bit that's changing though and Delongibugu now feels like a small town rather than a large village. It has a weekly market and there are several people now living there like a butcher and a carpenter you know who have uh, a profession which is largely non-agricultural and there's in fact uh, a settlement quite close by which is made up of blacksmiths, again, who spent at least half their time on their blacksmithing profession rather than farming. So that gives you some sense of the diversification which I'm sure will continue to expand. On the soil fertility front, I'm glad that you're also a somebody who's really interested and keen on soil because I mean, it is so much at the, the heart of everything that really matters. Um, it's World Desertification Day today, in fact. Uh, one of the reasons why we chose this date, because um, the question of how you maintain and improve the fertility of soils 
uh, how you use vegetation to do that, how you use uh, livestock and other um, supplements to maintain that soil fertility is pretty critical. Um, and one of the things I would like to do were I able to spend a bit of time back there would be to talk through with people, both farmers and herders, how some of the benefits of that integrated livestock crop relationship, which used to work so well, how elements of that could be brought back in to uh, manage the current situation. Barra, lovely comments, which uh, I fully subscribe to. Um, the whole question of, of households and needing to control labor. Yes, that's stability and maintenance of the household as a domestic group, I think is really critical. Um, in the 18th and 19th century, these households relied in part on captive labor for their, for their farming. One third of the population of uh, Delongibugu and the wider area was made up of captive labor in the 19th century. Um, and women and young women and young men say today, I'm nothing but a slave of the household, meaning that they recognize that they give an awful lot more than they, they get back. But as long as you stay in the household bit by bit, the reciprocal obligation towards you uh, tends to be returned over time. But I was fascinated by this, you know, the shifting balance over time between private and collective rights and obligations, because at the same time as I, I was there first, Mrs. Thatcher was taking over in, uh, in the UK, you know, and there was an awful lot of discussion about privatization and the importance of establishing private and individual um, economic incentives. And so uh, it was, it rang an awful lot of interesting bells and echoes, this um, question of reciprocity um, versus rights and, and the shift from a non-cash to a money-based um, system. Um, your last point about central government and policy. I mean, villagers basically said, we are really lucky because we are a long way away from regional and national government. You really don't want to be too close to the farmer, the governor, the source of power, you know, and as long as you're a bit far away, you can be um, ignored and the assets that you've got won't um, you know, be the envy of the, the ruler and so you can just carry on um, without it. But clearly, um, with the establishment of communes, as I implied, there's quite an um, impact on the fragmentation of customary power over land and other resources. I'd like to turn to those three questions. Uh, the first one was around climate. Um, I suppose the main issue that I see around climate is, um, is it going to make it impossible to farm in these dryland areas? Um, after the last rainy season, a number of the farmers in, in Delongabugu said, you know, with rain like that, we should start growing rice. You know, it's, you, you can't grow millet if your fields are flooded by this extraordinary downpour. Um, I don't think they will get round to growing rice because the soils are so sandy it wouldn't really make any sense. But if, if that whole area north of the river Niger were not able to um, support a farming population, I suppose it'd be a great thing for people who rely on livestock. And so probably you'd see a kind of shifting back to the south of a lot of that agricultural activity um, and a stronger presence of more livestock-based systems of, of production um, north of the River Niger. Uh, but, but currently, um, it's not really possible to get a decent uh, harvest of, of millet with the pattern of rainfall that they're having at the moment. Of course, they could possibly find um, different seed varieties that were better suited. And one of the things they have been doing is, is kind of checking around in neighboring villages to see if other farmers have got 
millet that's doing well under the current circumstances. Dan, your question about um, uh, data and the extent to which this um, is backed up by other more official sources of, of government statistics. I was very interested to compare our demographic data with what's in the government census. Um, and we've got a whole number of points at which that's possible to do. Um, and in general, um, the census figures are about 15 to 20% lower than the figures that we've got in the village and particularly at risk of being uh, left of uh, our older women um, and also quite a lot of children, particularly children who are not in the household of their original birth mother or father. So there's quite a lot of children who are brought in, adopted by another household. So there were, there were significant differences between our data and what government data said. What, what I also found marked was that much of the narrative in government is about how, you know, these are areas where everybody is just so impoverished, uh, life can't go on anymore, you know, uh, which gives the government the, the sort of right and duty to clear those lands and put them under irrigation. Um, so there's a, there's a narrative of impoverishment um, and um, traditionalism, which I think really doesn't pick up the uh, vitality and the intelligence um, of the people and how they've been trying to adapt and change. So um, the data don't really fit, I think, with quite a lot of the, um, the more formal indicators of what's going on. Um, Musa, your question on how far the big conflict in central and northern Mali impinges on what's going on here. There's, there's been no kind of direct involvement of jihadists in this village. Um, but I am aware of the fact that there are a number of, of camps of jihadists not very far away, and they do village, visit the village from time to time, as does the Malian army. Um, and villagers are meant to tell the army whenever um, such visits happen, which um, is obviously also quite a risky thing to do if, if it's known um, that... Um, people are informing on, on them. Um, the main thing I think that the conflict has done is to uh, destroy much of the national uh, and local economy. So a town like Segu, 50 miles, 50 kilometers away, used to have, you know, really quite a thriving tourist economy that um, into which people could sell a whole variety of goods and services that's completely disappeared. The NGOs that used to be present have also completely disappeared. So, and that's equally true in Bamako, so that the national economy doesn't have the capacity to uh, offer employment um, to the large number of young people who are now needing to find work. Camilla, thank you so much. And uh, well done also for covering such a lot of ground. Um, we're nearly out of time, but I do want to give you one fascinating question, which is actually the top voted on the, the voting system. Um, and this is from Jacques Kenjo. Um, Chinese investment in most parts of sub-Saharan Africa is progressively becoming the new norm. Huge parcels of land are being allocated to them by the Cameroonian government, for example, for farming at the expense of local farming communities. This creates unfair competition with local farmers. I wonder if you have any success stories from Dilongibugu where the evicted landowners um, were able to thrive after the arrival of the Chinese sugarcane farming giants. Was competition and rivalry among the villagers the most observable trend? Well, thanks very much, Jack, and uh, very nice to connect with you um, through the webinar. Uh, no, I think that the uh, impact of the Chinese investment has been really um, catastrophic. It's been catastrophic for the villages immediately 
evicted because um, they've lost all their land. They have to go and find land somewhere else, which they will never have, you know, total control over. So they have to go and beg, basically, from families, from neighbours, uh, from people 30 or 40 kilometres away. So right now, a lot of donkey carts are leaving places like Tegana, and they're setting off for two or three days. Everybody's piled on top of the donkey cart to go and establish for six months a rainy season farming camp out in the middle of the bush. So that's how they're trying to cope. Um, there were various um, promises of lots of jobs, schools, clinics, all sorts of wonderful infrastructure that was going to come with the investment. Um, none of that has happened. Um, the government uh, doesn't want to make too much of a fuss because China is such a massively important investor in many other aspects of Mali's uh, infrastructure. So roads, a new bridge, a new university, a new hospital. So as a consequence, local people bear the cost of all of this um, adverse impact. Uh, there's, no, there's no benefit to be seen at all. Um, and any attempts to try and call the company to account um, whenever local administrators try to do that to try and get their tax paid or to try and get the water rates paid, the company immediately rings up the embassy in Bamako who has a word with the government who then says, you know, back off. You shouldn't be hassling these guys. They're too important to us. So I'm afraid there's no silver lining to this particular case, and it'd be interesting to know if other particular cases um, can offer a better picture. And it, you know, I, it may well be that it's not only Chinese investment, but UK investment and um, other investment that shares some of these same difficulties. Thanks very much, Camilla. I should apologise at this point to the very many people who've submitted questions that we haven't been able to get to. Um, but please, if you want to send them in to me, for example, I'll do my best to forward them to Camilla and get you a reply. Please Anyone do. who I wasn't able to get to, uh, huge apologies. Um, but also huge thanks to Camilla. That was a fantastic presentation and Again, just emphasising, please do try and get hold of the book if you can, Land Investment and Migration, 35 Years of Village Life in Mali. It's incredibly rich, but also, as Nick emphasised, with some really perceptive comments about the future as well and about what we may see in these environments going forward in the next 35 years. So, um, Nick or Barra, do you have any final thoughts you want to offer? Before we close, no, Nick saying no, Barra, any final thoughts? Uh, no. Um, okay. Well, uh, no, 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 Surtout mes amis, comme vous se direz, et Jacob Adam, euh, qui m'ont soutenu pendant des années. Le livre est à mi point dans la traduction et j'espère que dans quelques mois, ça sera disponible en français. Et j'espère je, aussi que je viendrai à Bamako pour faire le, le lancement du livre français euh, dans quelques mois. Qui sait? J'espère. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Well, huge thanks to, firstly to you, Camilla, for a great presentation and for some fascinating discussion, but also to Nick and Barra for your careful reading of the book and really provocative and excellent questions. Um, so huge thanks to everyone and uh, thanks also to all the participants for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Bye. Barra. Thank you.